Thank you for listening to The History of the Papacy. I am your host, Steve. You can find show notes, how to connect with me, and sign up for our mailing list, along with how to support The History of the Papacy by going over to our website, a 2 Z History page. Dot com. Speaking of supporting the show, Patreon's a great way to do that. And we are on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. There's four tiers, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome, each of which represent one of the traditional patriarchates of Christianity. Now, one of the greatest benefits is that you will be immortalized on the history of the papacy diptychs in traditional Christianity. The diptychs are the list of bishops in order of their rank. And the higher, the sooner you sign up for Patreon, the higher you will be on the list. Now let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William, B, Brian, Jeffrey, Christina, John, Sarah, and William H. at the Alexandria level. Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, and John, all of whom are magnificent at Constantinople and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome. We have Peter the Great, Leonard the Great, and Alex the Great. As you know, we are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network. One of the great shows you should definitely check out is James Early's Key Battles of American History. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. Today, speaking of James Early, we have an episode which is a really kind of a bonus, interesting piece of the history of the story of the Christianization of the British Isles, that of the journey of Theodore of Tarsus. That's right, that's the same Tarsus in modern-day Turkey where Paul of the New Testament was born. James and I talk about how a man from all the way in southwestern modern-day Turkey could find himself in the middle of Anglo-Saxon England. It's a fascinating story. Now, after this episode, look for more new and fascinating stories from the history of the Pope's Christianity and religion. But before then, here is our next piece of the mosaic of the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Thanks again for joining us today on the History of the Papacy. We are joined again by Professor James Early, who If you listen to the last episode on the early history of the Anglo-Saxon Christianity, which I do suggest you listen to that episode because that will really inform a lot of what we talk about in today's episode. Professor James Early is an adjunct professor of history at San Jacinto College in Pasadena, Texas, which is near Houston. He's published one book and two scholarly articles. He also runs a blog and Facebook group called American History Fanatics. His main areas of research and interest include Eastern European history, the American Civil War, and the Cold War, but he's also done a lot of research on the early history of the Anglo-Saxon Church and Anglo-Saxon Christianity. He's done a lot of research on the person who we are going to talk about today, Theodore, Archbishop of Canterbury, who's a really fascinating character that I think, you know, these are the type of people who aren't often discussed, but I, I like to bring them to a fore in this podcast and talk about them and learn more about them because they really are fascinating people. Professor Early, why don't we start by just maybe telling a little bit why you were fascinated about Theodore? Theodore is a fascinating character. One, I find him interesting because almost nobody's ever heard of him. Even if you go and let's say you went into a a history fanatics group like mine or something, even if it wasn't American history fanatics, just a general history buffs group. And you said, how many of you have heard of Theodore of Tarsus? Probably maybe 10% would have heard of him. He, and he had a huge impact on the English church, despite the fact that he's very little known today. But I think what makes me especially fascinating about him is that he was an Eastern Christian originally. Okay. I'm an, I'm an Orthodox Christian. And so I'm, attracted to stories of other Orthodox Christians, but he didn't just stay in the East. He grew up in Syria, probably spoke Greek as his native language. He was probably fluent, or at least conversant in Syriac, and he 
fled and he ended up going to probably to Constantinople studying for a while. And then after that, he works his way over to Rome and becomes a monk in Rome and learns Latin and becomes very good at Latin and very proficient in Western Christianity. And then he gets tapped to go to this far off barbaric place called England. <laughs> and so here's this, this basically a Greek, a Syro Greek, if you will, who ends up leading the English church. He's the only Syrian and the only native Greek speaker that's ever been the head of the Church of England. And when I say Church of England, we have to be careful. It's not like the Church of England today. It was the, it's better to say the English church. But for all these things, I just find him really compelling and fascinating. And, and when we get into his life and work, I think it'll be even more apparent why he's so interesting. Yeah, I think that's what's really interesting about Theodore of Tarsus is Maybe a few hundred years earlier, somebody being born in the Middle East and then winding up in the British Isles was not as a unusual affair. But when you're getting into the 600s, that's very unusual. Yes. Travel was tough. <laughs> yeah, travel was tough. And it just that sort of communications mm -hmm. was was not happening. Let's just lay out a little bit about what was going on in the bigger scheme of things and a little bit about uh, Theodore of Tarsus's early life. So we'll pick up where we left off in our last episode. I, I hope our listeners, if you haven't listened to our discussion on the very early history of the Anglo-Saxon church, please do that. This will make a little more sense. But, but if you don't, it, it'll still make some sense. So we left off around 667 or so. And the church was in crisis at that point. We saw how the influence of the Archbishop of Canterbury had declined. We saw how England was divided into several smaller, small kingdoms. There was not a unified England and tended to be around seven kingdoms usually. And the, the kings of these kingdoms, they all wanted their own bishops to be the most powerful. They wanted autonomy. They didn't want to submit to the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was seen as the, the Bishop of Kent more than the Bishop of all of England. And in addition to that, you had bubonic plague that had swept through the land. It claimed the lives of many monks, many priests, many bishops, and it didn't even spare the archbishop. The archbishop of Canterbury himself, who was named Deus Dedit, he falls victim to the plague and he dies soon after the Council of Whitby, which we discussed last time in 664. And it took a while for the kings of England to figure out what to do. How are we going to replace this fellow? But finally, the kings of Northumbria and Kent, who were two of the most powerful kingdoms at the time. They picked a monk named Wighard, and they selected him. They said, you're going to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury, and we're going to send you to Rome to be consecrated Archbishop. We want this to be as official as possible. So Wighard travels to Rome, and the Pope at the time, who was named Vitalian, he consecrates him as the new Archbishop of Canterbury. Everything's good. He's about to go back and take his seat as the Archbishop in Canterbury, but he dies. So the plague doesn't spare even the highest in the church. Now, the Pope would have understood that in order for the English church to avoid total collapse, it needed strong, effective leadership, and it needed it soon. What was he going to do? The Pope could have sent a letter to the rulers of the various English kingdoms and said, pick another guy and send him down. I'm sorry, but your first choice died. But communication, as you mentioned earlier, was very slow at these times. And there's no guarantee that the letter would even reach its destination. And, and even if it did, it would take many more months for another potential archbishop to arrive in Rome. And that was assuming that the Anglo-Saxon Anglo kings could quickly agree on who to select. Uh, and of course, that was not likely. How are they going to come to a quick decision when it took them three years the last time? So the Pope makes a command decision. He decides, I'm just going to take matters into my own hand. I'm going to do something that had not been done since the days of Pope Gregory, which was, what, 70 years earlier. And he appoints an archbishop himself. All right. So Vitalian looks around and he tries to find somebody who would be a good archbishop to the English. He offers the position initially to a man named Hadrian, who was a scholarly abbot of a southern Italian monastery. He had impeccable qualifications, saintly man, uh, older man, experienced, scholarly, but Hadrian declines. He says, well, I'm unworthy for such an exalted position. He recommended another monk named Andrew. And Andrew also was offered the position. And Andrew declines it, saying, I'm sorry, I'm just not healthy enough to do it. So Vitalian, by this time, is like, oh, I can't get anybody. Come on, somebody. Anyone? Anyone? 
But he urges Hadrian again. He says, come on, Hadrian, you got to do this. And But the humble abbot just says, no, I will not do it. But then Hadrian recommended a Syrian monk. He said, you know, there's this guy from the east. Uh, you know, he's Greek. He may be a little weird, but but he's been in Rome for a long time. His name is Theodore. Why don't you select him? He lived in a monastery near Rome. He was also very scholarly. And according to the Venerable Bede, Theodore, quote, was learned in both sacred and secular literature in Greek and in Latin of proved integrity and of the venerable age of 66. Now, 66 is not young today, but back then it was like being 100 today. I mean, that, that was very old, way past your prime, way past the average life expectancy. And given that Theodore was an elderly man and a native of the Greek-speaking East, which the, the Latins never really fully trusted, Theodore was an unlikely candidate for the key position, the, the head of the English church. But Pope Vitalian was in a hurry, and he really had no good reason to not appoint Theodore. So on the condition that Hadrian go with Theodore to make sure that the archbishop, and I love this quote, Steve, the archbishop, he, the Pope tells Hadrian, make sure that he does not introduce any Greek customs which conflicted with the teachings of the true faith. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, keep him in line, Hadrian. None of this weird Greek stuff, okay? Uh, and so vi- the Pope uh, adopts the recommendation, and he actually consecrates Theodore as the Archbishop of Canterbury right there in Rome. And two months later, Theodore, accompanied by Hadrian and some other people, set out and they head for England. So there you go. Interesting story of how Theodore was selected. And now a word from our sponsors. Let's talk a little bit about Theodore's life before going to England. Where did he start off and how did he make that interesting journey? Well, as is always the case, in, or is usually the case when we're dealing with uh, late antiquity or <clears throat> early medieval period, there's, the sources are very weak, very limited. So we don't know a ton about Theodore's life prior to his consecration as the Archbishop of Canterbury. But there's been a lot of scholarship in the late 20th century and early 21st that has pieced together some details. And there are documents that seem to have been penned by Theodore himself or his students and they give us a pretty plausible picture of his life and career prior to 668 when he was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury. So Theodore was probably born around the year 602 in the Syrian Greek-speaking town of Tarsus. And of course, anybody who knows their Christian history knows that Tarsus is where the Apostle Paul was from. So a very famous, uh, very prestigious place, I guess, to be born. I don't know if it was so prestigious at this time, but I mean, it's the, it's the city of St. Paul, so pretty impressive. Theodore was born, uh, as I said, in the early 600s, and at that time, Tarsus lay firmly within the Eastern Roman Empire, or the Byzantine Empire, as it was later called. During most of late antiquity, bright young Syrians who wished to further their studies would, would do that in Antioch. Antioch, of course, was the financial, the political, the intellectual capital of Roman Syria. Theodore probably spent some time then studying in Antioch, and there are some biblical commentaries that have survived from Theodore's school. We'll talk about that later. Um, but there is evidence from some of these commentaries that Theodore may have also spent time in this eastern city of Edessa. Edessa was a big center of Eastern Christianity um, in the first few centuries of the church. Theodore's exposure in Edessa to Syriac Christianity probably enriched his theological thought, especially his Christology. You know, we talk about two schools of biblical interpretation, the Antiochian school and the Alexandrian school. Theodore was definitely uh, a representative of the Antiochian school, which was a more literal way of looking at the Bible. Not, not a lot of allegory among those thinkers. So Theodore was influenced by some of the Antiochian school leaders, like people like John Chrysostom and uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia and some others that were what we would call more biblical literalists. They, they didn't allegorize everything as would happen in most of the Catholic Church later on. All right, so if, you, if our listeners know their history, the, there was an invasion by Persian forces, and then eventually the Muslims arose and they swept through Syria. And at that time, Theodore seems to have joined thousands of other Christians who fled west to get out of there. Uh, Theodore likely fled from the Muslim invasions, went further west. He might have gone to Athens. There's a letter by Pope Zacharias in a letter written in 748 to the English missionary Boniface uh, that 
hints that Theodore might have gone to Athens, but it's not conclusive. But more recent scholars think that Theodore probably went to Constantinople. This is based on some comments made by Bede and by some of Theodore's disciples. So again, Theodore, probably after he left Tarsus, ends up in Constantinople. And at that time, Constantinople was experiencing a cultural and intellectual revival under the patronage of the Emperor Heraclius. And so while he was there, Theodore would have studied many disciplines, including biblical exegesis, theology, literature, rhetoric, the sciences, and even medicine. So he probably became kind of a jack of all trades there. But whether or not he studied in Athens or, as is more likely, Constantinople, these studies in the Greek world would bear a lasting imprint on his thought that would in turn impact the Anglo-Saxon church. Now, he's going to move on further west. We don't know why. We don't exactly know what prompted him to do this. But Theodore, we do know, made his way to Rome. When he chose to relocate to Rome is unknown, but it's almost certain that he was there by 649. And he seems to have settled in an Eastern Rite monastery near the city of Rome. As with many other details of Theodore's life, the exact monastery where he lived is uncertain. But according to one scholar, it's probably a a monastery that was called Aqua Salvius, or the the Saving Waters. This later became known as the Monastery of St. Anastasius the Persian. And while he was at this monastery, Theodore would have worked to improve his knowledge of Latin, and he would have continued to study scripture, of course, Western and Eastern patristic theology, and the other subjects that he'd studied in Constantinople. Now, there is one interesting thing that seems to involve Theodore. In 649, the Pope at the time, who was Martin I, he convened a Lateran Council. This council was convened with the purpose of condemning the monothelite heresy. And I don't want to go into that too much detail. It's just the monothelite heresy was the idea that Christ had one will, two natures, but one will. And that was a big controversy over that. And the Pope was definitely opposed to it. And if you look at the list of signatories to the council's decisions, there's one name that says Theodorus Monachus, in the words Theodore the monk. So is this Theodore of Tarsus? We can't be sure, but it seems pretty likely. Together with, you know, Theodore's expertise in Greek patristic theology, he probably would have been very helpful in helping the Pope and some of the the Roman bishops and the Italian bishops to, what are these weird Greeks talking about? Help, <laughs> can you read this Greek document and explain it to us? Theodore would have been critical in that, I think. He probably helped craft the statement. So Theodore's work with the Lateran Council must have solidified his reputation in the Roman church as a brilliant scholar who had a firm grasp of both the Western and Eastern Christian theological traditions, and it would have qualified him and given him a reputation as a man who was very well suited to teach a nation of relatively new converts to the Christian faith. How much do you know about would Theodore have left Tarsus because of the expansion of Islam or because that's pretty close to more or less of that his time or we just don't know? Oh, I think that's definitely probably the reason he left. You know, thousands of Christians fled the the region that we now call the Middle East, Syria and what is now Lebanon and other areas. A lot of Christians fled to get out of there. Uh, so they could go back to the West and practice their Christianity more freely without having Muslim overlords. So it's completely conceivable, and I would say even likely that Theodore was among those refugees. Let's talk about Theodore and how he gets to England, and then what are some of the things, the major reforms that he does there? So he left He left in uh, 668 from Rome with a, a bunch of companions, and he traveled. Of course, he would have gone probably partly on horse, partly on foot, through northern Italy. And he went through, we know he went through Gaul or the Frankish kingdom. He probably stopped along the way and met up with some of the Frankish bishops. He finally arrives in Canterbury on May 27th, 669, one year after he left Rome. You know, I have to say this too. The man was 66 years old, which at the time, as we said earlier, was very very ancient. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very elderly man. They must have thought, you know, this guy is going to be a caretaker. He'll be, I mean, he, he's going to do well, but he can't last that long. He's 66 for crying out loud. Some of the other bishops, archbishops of Canterbury didn't even live that long. But anyway, they're going to have a surprise on their hands. <laughs> All right. So Bede, Bede writes that the archbishop soon visited every part of the island occupied by the English peoples and received a ready welcome and hearing everywhere. So that's probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but 
but it seems like he was well received. He found a church that was growing rapidly in numbers, but it was in need of structural reforms. As we saw, England, again, bears repeating, is divided into several small kingdoms, and each one of the kings wants their bishop to be the top dog. They want more power and prestige for their own bishop. They don't necessarily want to submit to a single bishop in southeastern England, in Kent, or Canterbury is the city. So the the church was really a mess. It wasn't organized very well. It was divided into six bishoprics. And only Kent had two of those. East Anglia and Northumbria had only one each. So you have these really large bishoprics. You had this idea of one kingdom, one bishop, one bishopric. And of course, that's that's not going to work very well when you're getting more and more converts to Christianity and the number of churches is growing and the number of monasteries is growing and the number of believers is growing. One bishop just can't handle all the Christians in an entire kingdom, even if it is a small kingdom. And... Even though that we, I said there were six bishoprics, but only two of them actually had a bishop leading them. You know, it's kind of nice to actually have someone there, <laughs> you know, taking care of the church. There was a man named Bishop Weenie, but that's kind of a weird name, W-I-N-I. He was the Bishop of London, and he had purchased his office, which unfortunately was very common in the early church and in the Middle Ages, definitely. So he was kind of shady. And then you had a man named Bishop Chad, but he had been uncanonically or not officially, not correctly inserted into the Sea of York while its rightful bishop, Wilfred, traveled to Gaul to be consecrated. And so one scholar, a man named Nicholas Brooks, has written that many local churches and monasteries were without ordained priests and deacons. The education of the clergy had been interrupted and the Christian gospel had ceased to be preached in many areas. So Theodore sees this mess, this horrible situation of a lack of leadership and where there was leadership, it wasn't great leadership. So he decides he's going to quickly try to correct this. So he restores Wilfred as Bishop of York. He deposed Chad, who had been stuck in Wilfred's place, but he turns around and makes Chad the Bishop of Mercia. He appoints bishops for Rochester, East Anglia, and Wessex. And each of the six English bishoprics now had a leader. So that's good. At least we have the number of bishoprics equals the number of bishops. That's always nice. But then he he goes into uh, stage two, if you will, of his plan. He realizes that the English dioceses were too few in number, and they were too large for one bishop to adequately serve the pastoral needs of the increasing amount of Christians. So Theodore decides to divide the diocese into smaller, more manageable units. He, he's going to break it down. You know, maybe one bishop can't rule over thousands of people. So he unveils his plan at the Council of Hertford. This is one of two councils of the English church that were held during Theodore's uh, time as archbishop. It was convened in 673. And this council, despite agreeing on canons containing rules concerning marriage, the behavior of clergy, that was always a problem. Clergy not behaving in a very Christian manner. (laughs) Meetings of the English Synod and the celebration of Easter. But it apparently could not agree about the division of dioceses. The council's ninth canon reads this, quote, It was generally discussed that more bishops shall be consecrated as the number of the faithful increases, but we have announced no decision in the manner for the present. So in other words, in, in, the, in, the, in regard to the issue of how many more bishops are we going to have, they punted. So the lack of support among the, the, the church made Theodore unable to enact any major reorganization of the English diocese. But he did create one new bishopric for Essex, and he divided the bishopric of East Anglia into two. Then he made further changes later. Uh, In 678, a quarrel broke out between Bishop Wilfred in Northumbria and King Egfrith, who was the king of Northumbria. And the king kicked out the bishop, Bishop Wilfred, and this gave Theodore the opportunity he needed. Theodore quickly divided Wilfred's former see into three. So Northumbria is now going to have three bishoprics. And he appoints new bishops. And then later he tried to create two more bishoprics, one in Hexham and one in Ripon. Now, the biographer of Wilfred was a man named Edius Stephanus. Remember, Wilfred was the Archbishop of York, or I don't know if he had the title Archbishop, but let's just say Bishop of York, who the king booted out. His biographer condemns Theodore for dividing up the diocese. He accuses him of accepting bribes from the king and his queen. But that's probably not true. Almost all scholars say that's just partisanship. 
Theodore did act opportunistically and somewhat high-handedly, but his basic motivation was pastoral. In other words, Theodore's reason for splitting up the bishopric of Northumbria was he wanted to have more dioceses, smaller dioceses, to assure that English bishops could serve the needs of their growing flocks. It just makes sense. And at the meantime, Wilfred takes matters into his own hands. He goes to Rome and he pleads with the Pope, this is Pope Agatho, to restore him to his see. He says, I've done nothing worthy of deposition. And so the Pope calls a council. The council rules that the original division of the Diocese of York uh, or Northumbria into three smaller units was valid, but that the two additional bishoprics must be abolished. And Wilfred is reestablished as Bishop of York. So in other words, the Pope says, we'll support some of what Theodore did, but not all of it. You're not going to have five dioceses, but you can have three. And as you can imagine, relations between Theodore and Bishop Wilfred were not very good for a while, but they did later reconcile. And more significantly, a precedent had been set for Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to contain multiple dioceses rather than merely one or two. So the question is settled. We can't just have one diocese per kingdom. We need to have more than one. One other thing that uh, ecclesiastically that Theodore did is he, he convened a second council in 680 in Hatfield. And whereas the other council, the Hertford Council in 673, had been more concerned with church organization and clerical behavior, this one was a theological council. Under Theodore's leadership, the council affirmed a belief in the Trinity it formally accepted the teachings of the first five ecumenical councils. Those are the only ones that had been held to that point. And the 649 Lateran Council, which we talked about Theodore was probably part of. <clears throat> and it also responded to the monothelite controversy, condemning that, that monothelite heresy. And uh, it may have been Theodore responding to charges of heterodoxy raised, raised by Wilfred, but we don't know that for sure. But anyway, so it's a theological one where the English church essentially, to sum up, they say we're on board with Rome and we agree everything that Rome teaches. The last 10 years of Theodore's archiepiscopate proved to be relatively uneventful, except for the creation of a few more additional bishoprics. So he's continuing to multiply the number of bishops and bishoprics. By the time of his death in 690, at the age of 88, very impressive, the See of Canterbury had been reestablished as the leading bishopric in England. So Canterbury had reestablished control over the church in England. And the church had a much more effective structure, much better leadership, and its orthodoxy and communion with Rome were unquestionable. And now a word from our sponsors. Somebody who was probably meant to be a placeholder yeah, he went in there and really cleaned up and organized and, and to use a, a cliche, he brought the English church into the 8th century. <laughs> he he made it uh, much more in line with the way Christianity was being practiced and organized in the rest of the Roman world or, or Roman world, if you will, you know, the, the Roman Catholic world, we'll say. Now, Theodore also made some changes as a teacher and a scholar he changed the that whole mindset of the English church or tried to reform it. What um, what did he do in those areas? He set up a school in Canterbury to educate English clergy. As we mentioned earlier, one of the problems, I mean, this is an ongoing problem throughout the history of the church is that you have priests that don't know what the heck they're doing. They can't say the Latin mass. They're running around having concubines and <laughs> there's all kinds of problems with, with clergy. So, Theodore is trying to correct that. According to Bede, Theodore and his friend Hadrian, quote, attracted a large number of students into whose mind they poured the waters of wholesome knowledge day by day. In addition to instructing them in the Holy Scriptures, they also taught their pupils poetry, astronomy, and the calculation of the church calendar, <laughs> which we talked about earlier. It's, it's very complicated. Um, and this school, so, so this school that Theodore and Hadrian created was not just to uh, teaching Bible and theology, but they taught Latin learning, Latin literature, astronomy, all kinds of stuff. It was almost like a, a university long before you had universities, it was an informal school, uh, informal university. It was very effective, obviously, 60 years after the school's founding, when Bede wrote the ecclesiastical history, Bede says, quote, some of their students still alive today are as proficient in Latin and Greek as in their native tongue. So that's pretty good. Uh, they, these students, these young men that Theodore and Hadrian taught were really good at Latin and really good at Greek, which was kind of a new thing for the English church. Greek had not been 
a, a major concern until this point. In fact, so well did Theodore and Hadrian's students know Greek that Edius Stephanus, the biographer of Wilford that I mentioned earlier, he complained one time that a group of representatives of Theodore's successor, Archbishop Berthwald, went on business in Rome. They spoke Greek among themselves. <laughs> so this guy's saying, man, these, these are English people and they're speaking Greek. Come on. But uh, Theodore and Hadrian's students included many future bishops and abbots, including figures that uh, they're not famous to the average person, but they're pretty big cheeses in English church history. John of Beverly, who would be the Bishop of Hexham and of York, Octfor, the Bishop of Worcester, Tobias, Bishop of Rochester, Albinus, who succeeded Hadrian as the head of the school, and even Berthwald, the next Archbishop of Canterbury. So um, even Theodore's own successor was trained by Theodore and Hadrian. Hadrian really ran the school. He was the kind of the schoolmaster, and uh, Theodore taught there, but of course, Theodore's main job was to run the church. However, the most famous disciple of Theodore and Hadrian by far is a man named Aldhelm. He later became Bishop of Sherborne. He was also a great Anglo-Latin writer. He was an Anglo-Saxon who became so good at Latin that he composed some of the most complicated Latin poetry ever written. Latin becomes so well known by the Anglo-Saxons that eventually they develop a reputation of being the greatest Latin scholars in all of Europe, you know, so much so that later Charlemagne, when he, he wants someone to set up his school system, who does he get? Not a Roman. He gets an Anglo-Saxon, a man named Alcuin of York, but that's much later than this. John Blair, the historian I mentioned earlier, this is what he had to say about the Canterbury school's impact. He said, the creative meeting of Roman and insular cultures combined with patronage on a huge scale empowered an exceptional group of individuals and enabled some of the greatest intellectual and artistic achievements of 7th and 8th century Western Europe to occur among the recently barbarian illiterate English. So what Theodore did and Hadrian uh, by starting this school is, is simply amazing. Here you have people that are, you know, just a century earlier or so, their ancestors had been sitting around throwing bones at each other, you know, chopping each other's heads off. Now they're sitting around studying Latin and Greek. They're writing Latin poetry. They're studying astronomy. They're, 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 they become the greatest scholars in all of Europe. So that's pretty darn impressive, don't you think? Does Theodore have anything to do with the Anglo-Saxon church? Because the Anglo-Saxon church, they were really masters of Latin, but they were also known for using Anglo-Saxon language. Did he foster that at all, or was that a different innovation? We really don't know because all of the documentary evidence always talks about his use of Latin and Greek. But, you know, all these guys that they trained, they would have gone back to their parishes, their parish assignments or their bishoprics, and they would have spoken Anglo-Saxon. I mean, these are Anglo-Saxon guys. That's their native tongue. And when they preach, they would use Anglo-Saxon. There's no doubt that there was some Anglo-Saxon probably, I don't know about scholarship, but at least some training going on there. One other thing I want to mention is that Theodore was not just a great teacher, but he was a theologian and a biblical scholar in his own right. And this really hasn't been known very well or appreciated until pretty recently. I'm, I'm saying like around 1950-ish or so. Until the mid-20th century, scholars believe that none of Theodore's writings, nor those of his disciples, except for Aldhem, had survived. As late as 1970, one Cambridge scholar wrote that the lack of surviving books of Theodore's age, whether imported or written in Canterbury itself, is awful. He, he was just saying it's terrible that we don't have anything left from Theodore. But this began to change. In 1936, a German scholar discovered a group of manuscripts in Milan, of all places, that contained biblical commentaries written in Latin, but they had glosses in Greek and Old English. So uh, in case our listeners don't know what a gloss is, a gloss huh. is when somebody's reading something, let's say in Latin, and they put a note in the margin in Greek or even in Old English. So isn't that interesting? Here's Old English glosses being found in a library in Milan. Let's say you're an Anglo-Saxon young man and you're in this school and you're reading Latin. You may write a note off to the side. Well, what he means here is this. It's like a little mini commentary and it's in Old English. But this, this scholar, uh, Biscoff, the German, he didn't publish his findings in English until 1994, so almost 60 years later, or maybe they were published after his death. I'm not an expert on him personally, but wow. But anyway, well, it was, it was actually him. Biscoff and Lappage published um, 
amazing work, a very important work on theater called Biblical Commentaries from the Canterbury School of Theodore and Hadrian. And this is a huge, massive book. Um, I had it for a while. I checked it out, but I didn't buy it because it's very expensive. But it contains the Latin text of the commentaries that Theodore wrote. These are his commentaries on the Bible, the Old English and Greek glosses, and the English translations of all. So the commentaries, and they were probably written not by Theodore so much himself, but mainly by his students, but they do reflect his teaching. And they reveal a lot about his background, his interpretation of scripture and his theology. And I could go into all kinds of details on that. There's there's like little notes in the margin or glosses about, well, this animal uh, exists in Syria. I remember seeing him or the teacher remembers him when he was a young man, things like that. So it, it's really interesting stuff. And about the same time that Biscoff and Lappage finished this commentary, uh, another scholar named Jane Stevenson, Stevenson published a detailed study of a late 7th century theological work called the Liturculus Malalianus. Sorry, it's Latin. <laughs> and this work, the Liturculus, was a reworking of a chronology by the Byzantine scholar John Malalus, and it was written by none other than Archbishop Theodore. Now, What's interesting, Steve, is there's a guy, and I actually know him, not personally, but I met him through Facebook, a fellow named James Siemens. He's actually a Greek Catholic or Byzantine Catholic priest in England. He's a scholar at Cardiff University in Wales. He took Stevenson's work one step further, and he showed that the Liturculus demonstrates a Christology heavily influenced by the Eastern Church Fathers, Irenaeus of Lyon and Ephraim the Syrian. So how about that? Here's a work written by Theodore in Latin, but it reflects some of the most famous Eastern theologians, or early theologians, Irenaeus and St. Ephraim the Syrian. Um, Theodore saw Christ's work primarily in terms of recapitulation, and I'm sure you've talked about that in the history of the papacy at some point, recapitulation. And that's the idea that Christ became man and lived through each of the stages of human existence, in full obedience to God in order to set right what Adam and all of his progeny had ruined through their self-centeredness and disobedience. So pretty cool, huh? Yeah, wow, that's incredible. Here you have the, the Archbishop of Canterbury reintroducing or maybe introducing the ideas of Irenaeus, who was originally from the East, and Ephraim the Syrian. Yeah, a lot of ideas coming full circle there. Yeah, that's why I find Theodore so fascinating. He's a, he's a real bridge between east to west he seems to have introduced at least some eastern ideas into the english church now they wouldn't last forever of course but uh they were there for a while i want to talk about one other work of theodore real quick and that's his penitential and this again like the biblical commentary that i mentioned earlier it was probably not written by him personally but it was a collection of his teaching that was assembled by his disciples after his death now, what is a penitential? Well, a penitential is a written guide for priests and bishops who heard confessions that offered relatively standardized penances for a wide variety of sins. In other words, okay, what do you do if somebody confesses to adultery? Well, here's the penance. What do you do if they've committed adultery 10 times? Here's the penance and so on. What if they've stolen? That way, confessions and penances were standardized. Theodore's penitential was influenced by early Irish examples, and it was one of the first to appear in Western Christendom outside of Ireland. Contrary to the prevailing practice of Latin Christianity at the time, Theodore's penances reveal an optimistic view of humanity. Okay, so more of an Eastern idea that sin is not so much breaking God's law and transgressing against the Almighty Creator of the universe, but sin is a sickness, sin is a disease, and it needs to be healed more than punished. That's a very Eastern emphasis, in which Theodore. Uh, puts into these penances. If his penances, they as I mentioned, they a positive or optimistic view of humanity, and they're focused less on punishment than on restoring the sinner to spiritual wholeness. How about that? That's that's a very orthodox or Eastern idea. I'm not saying that that was absent from Western theology, but it was not the big stress that they had. Theodore designed his penances in the words of James Siemens, the scholar I mentioned earlier. With a view, this is a quote, with a view to the individual taking up his or her place again among the members of the liberated and restored, and to deal with an individual's sins as if they were wounds on the body as a whole and in need of healing, lest they should corrupt what has been restored. So there, there you go. That's, that's three major contributions that Theodore made to theology and practice, his biblical commentaries, his uh, 
Laterculus malalianus. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but that's his basically his Christology and then his penitential. That's really fascinating. What's Theodore's legacy today? You've given us a lot of background. He did a lot of different things to reform the church. He brought in a lot of different, maybe you might call new thinking from where he had originally come from in Syria. So how, what did his legacy, what kind of legacy did he leave on the English church? The short answer is a huge one, but I'll go into a little more detail. The great English historian Frank Stenton has described Theodore's archiepiscopate as, quote, the prelude to a new period in the history of the Anglo-Saxon church. So it's a sea change. It's a watershed moment in Anglo-Saxon ecclesiastical history. Theodore unified the English church. He increased the number and quality of its bishops. He strengthened the authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury and He provided the church with a solid organizational footing that made it better able to grow and minister to the spiritual needs of the Anglo-Saxons. And then, again, we'll talk a little bit more about the school. What was the impact of the school, which, again, was largely forgotten about until pretty recently, at least what it taught. So the Canterbury School of Theodore and Hadrian, it was the first of its type in England. This is the first time you'd had a major center of Mediterranean learning, Latin and Greek and that kind of thing. It acted as a potent, this is uh, Father Siemens, by the way, it acted as a potent stimulus to the already incipient movement of the Anglo-Saxons away from barbarism and towards literate civilization. Actually, that's from a scholar named Peter Hunter Blair. So Theodore, to sum that up, he helped bring the Anglo-Saxons more into the Roman world in terms of Roman Christian practice and Roman scholarship and Latin learning and things like that. The school itself, sadly, does not seem to have long outlived its founders, Uh, so it didn't last super duper long, but it did leave a living legacy through the scholar leaders that it trained, most notably Aldhelm. And although scholars of previous generations generally held that Theodore's biblical and theological teaching had little influence on future Anglo-Saxon or continental scholars, Recent work by Father James Siemens, who I already mentioned a couple of times, Siemens has demonstrated that no less a scholar than the Venerable Bede is likely to have used the the Laterculus Malalianus. I got it that time. Third time's a charm. And he also, Bede seems to have used Theodore's biblical commentaries as sources for his own writings. So there's connections between Theodore and Bede, and everybody knows that Bede was the greatest scholar of his time in all of Europe, not just in England, but anywhere. Bede was amazing. He wrote so much stuff that I don't think you could read it all in your lifetime. But um, but perhaps none of Theodore's teachings had as great an impact as those that came to be preserved in his penitential. His penitential became highly popular and widespread throughout the Western Church, and it became, in the words of one scholar, the standard form for such a work in the Western Church for centuries afterward. So Theodore's penitential was not just It became the standard, not just in England, but all throughout Western Europe. So in summary, I think we can say that there was no Archbishop of Canterbury during the early Anglo-Saxon period that was more effective or more influential than Theodore. Considering all that the Syrian Archbishop of Canterbury, that is Theodore, did for his church and his nation, it's no wonder that Bede would later write of Theodore's time that, quote, never had there been such happy times as these since the English settled in Britain. That is just really an amazing story from beginning to end. So much, so much history tied together, so much geography that was not connected at that time. He made so many connections and influenced Western Christianity, which was really just in its cradle at this point. What would become like what you would call medieval Christianity? Oh, absolutely. This is, this is long before Charlemagne and this is. You know, it's what, a hundred years, almost a hundred years before Charlemagne or so. And it's b- before Alfred. It's before a lot of the main key figures in Western Christian history. Would you say that he even influenced beyond medieval Christianity? I don't know about that because I think, other than maybe with the penitentials, the, the, the penitentials later tended to get much stricter. Um, and I think that a different type of Roman Christianity develops in the West. I kind of have a theory that, that the Roman church became Germanized, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, because we know that, I mean, the Franks, they were originally Germans. They were Germanic peoples. Charlemagne was German. 
the the Visigoths were Germans, the Ostrogoths, the Lombards, all these people that ended up taking over in Western Europe were from a Germanic background. And I personally think they they really altered Roman theology and Roman practice, but I, that would take a lifetime to, <laughs> to prove yeah, or to, a different story I mean, I, for I, a different day. I've seen plenty of evidence that would take a whole series on this podcast, but uh, I know like one Orthodox scholar, John, Father John Romanidis wrote on this, but so I think the kind of Christianity that Theodore brought and that Bede practiced eventually gets replaced by kind of a different flavor of Christianity that's brought in late, especially after the Norman conquest of 1066. I don't know. It's the tougher, harsher type of Christianity, in my opinion. But that's just me. Well, it's not just me, but it's, a lot of people think that. But that, that's my opinion. How do you think that Theodore gets lost to time? Well, he, it's because his, the writings we saw, they didn't they disappeared for the longest time. I mean, you know, here's here's this commentary with glosses in Greek and even in Anglo-Saxon. And it's buried in a library in Milan for several hundred years. That that just happens, you know. We all the time. I shouldn't say all the time, but every once in a while, you read about somebody discovering a new manuscript in a monastery that was under ten layers of dust, <laughs> and it's, it's yeah. oh wow, this is cool. Uh, <laughs> there's a new manuscript, or people things get buried and people forget about them, and 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 I think too that once the Normans took over England, and to me, completely changed the nature of the country and the church. There wasn't this desire for continuity with the previous people, the Anglo-Saxons. The Anglo-Saxons were not cool for the longest time, so a lot of people just didn't care about what they had to say, I think, except for maybe Bede. Well, James, I know that you're an, um, known as an American history man, but I think we're going to have to drag you back into early church history because I... <laughs> oh, no, a, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're dragging you back because I have learned so much from these two conversations and I, I definitely want to hear more. Well, we'll, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to put, have you put down biographies of James K. Polk and uh, other <laughs> yeah. presidents and pick up, pick up more early church books, early yeah, church well, fanatics. I've certainly studied it a lot, although I'm pretty rusty, but we'll see what we can do. If people do want to learn more about some of your American history fanaticism, so to speak, where can we, <laughs> where can we learn about that? Uh, probably the best thing to do would be to go to Facebook and look for the group, search for the group called American History Fanatics, and there you'll find myself and about 1,100 other people that just love the history of the United States and, and America in general, and, and we'd love to have you. We, we have lots of fun stuff we do. We do quizzes. We do uh, alternate history scenarios sometimes. We do uh, contests and we do polls and 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 a lot of it's just really cool articles that people post. So yeah, I recommend that everybody check it out. I think we have the start of the early church fanatics. And I want to <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, James. And I I definitely hope to have you on the history of the papacy again. 